Section 2, Programming with CUDA. In this section, we'll explore the nuts and bolts of programming with CUDA. We'll learn about the programming model and how that maps to the hardware. Then we'll look at some hands-on examples of launching kernels, debugging device code, and handling errors. The CUDA programming model. In this video, we'll learn about the software and hardware architectures of CUDA and how those connect to each other to allow us to write scalable, parallel programs. We're going to cover three main topics. First, the CUDA software stack, which consists of the driver and runtime APIs. Second, the execution model, which is based around kernels, threads, and blocks. And finally, the hardware architecture, which provides fast and scalable execution of CUDA programs. There's a lot to learn here, and it can get a bit abstract, so bear with me. We'll get back to hands-on examples in the next video. The CUDA display driver includes a low-level interface called the Driver API. This is available on any system with an NVIDIA driver. You can access it directly, but it's usually not very convenient. We won't be using it much in this course. The CUDA toolkit includes a higher-level interface called the Runtime API. You can access it by using the CUDA syntax extensions and compiling your program with NVCC. By default, NVCC will statically link your program with the Runtime library. You can also link dynamically and ship the runtime library with your application. In our array add example, you can see that we include the CUDA runtime API header file. This provides all the basic functions we used, like CUDA malloc and CUDA memcopy. Both APIs are versioned, and the driver API is backward compatible but not forward compatible. So the driver API version on your system must be greater than or equal to the runtime API version that you built against, or the program won't run. You can find out the API versions with the device query sample that we looked at in the last section. So right now I have a driver which provides the 10.2 API, and my program was built with the 10.1 runtime API. Since the driver API is newer, I won't have any problems. If you're shipping an application that needs to run on systems with older drivers, you may need to use an earlier version of the toolkit. You can find the minimum required driver in the release notes for each version of the toolkit. Now we'll talk about the execution model. You'll recall that in our example program, we put our device code in a special function called a kernel. Kernels are launched from the host and then executed in parallel by multiple threads on the device, typically one thread for each data element you want to process. Here's the kernel from our example. It adds one element from A and B to produce one element of the result. Threads are grouped into blocks, and the blocks are arranged into a grid. Blocks and grids can have one, two, or three dimensions, which we'll learn more about later. Threads within the same block share certain resources and can communicate or synchronize with each other. This will become really important later on when we start implementing some more complicated parallel algorithms. The arrangement of the grid can also impact performance, as we'll see in the next section. Finally, let's talk about the hardware architecture. CUDA devices contain multiple streaming multiprocessors. These use a single instruction, multiple thread, or SIMT architecture with hardware multithreading support. We'll look at each of these concepts in a little more detail. A CUDA device is made up of several streaming multiprocessors, or SMs. Each SM contains a number of CUDA cores, as well as some cache, registers, and memory, which are all shared between the cores. The device also has a larger pool of global memory, which is shared by all the SMs. The exact numbers for all of this depend on your hardware. For example, in this system I have a GeForce GT1030. It has three SMs, with 128 CUDA cores each, for a total of 384 cores. These CUDA cores are very minimal. They don't have any branch prediction or speculative execution, which allows hundreds or thousands of them to fit on a single chip. Every CUDA device is identified by a compute capability, which indicates its general hardware features and specifications. For example, my card is compute capability 6.1, which means, among other things, that each SM has 64,000 registers and 96 kilobytes of shared memory. For full specifications of each compute capability, you can look at Appendix H of the CUDA programming guide. NVIDIA calls their hardware architecture SIMT for single instruction multiple thread. This basically means that you have many lightweight threads running the same instructions across different data. 
Unlike SIMD vector instructions that you have on CPUs, where each instruction has a fixed vector width, in a SIMT architecture you can adjust the number of threads, and each thread actually has some independent state. Individual threads can even run different instructions, although this is typically less efficient. This architecture allows CUDA programs to scale across different hardware. You don't have to worry about the exact number of SMs or cores available, because CUDA will take care of creating and scheduling all your threads. CUDA hardware executes threads in groups of 32, which are called warps. All the threads in a warp will run at the same time, on the same SM, and typically will execute the same instructions. The execution context for each warp stays on the SM for the entire lifetime of the warp, which means there's no overhead for switching between warps. This hardware multi-threading model allows CUDA to manage thousands of threads very efficiently. So putting this all together, this is basically what happens when you run a kernel. The blocks are assigned to available SMs. You will often have more blocks than can run at one time, in which case some of them will wait. Each block is split into warps of 32 threads, which are scheduled and run on the SMs. You can have multiple warps and blocks running on each SM, and the hardware will switch between them whenever a warp needs to wait. As blocks finish executing, the SMs are freed up and CUDA will schedule new blocks until the entire grid is done.